Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, and thank you all for listening in to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. My guest today is a unique perspective to share with all of us. Before attending culinary school, she had attended and graduated from law school and was licensed to practice in the state of New York. So what was it that influenced her to change careers and pursue a a culinary arts degree and a new life as a private chef? Well, that is just one of the questions we're going to ask today as part of her culinary school story. With that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Chef Amber Plecker. Amber, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I haven't seen you in, uh, how long has it been? 10 years? Mm -hmm. Wow. Excited to hear all about what you're doing. You're in Georgia now. Is that Yes, I moved to Savannah about three years ago from South Florida. Great. I want to hear about that as well. So let's get right to it and cut the straight to the suspense that we've been p- promoting there. Why did you decide, after getting a degree in education, a degree in law, and passing the bar to practice, did you want to go to culinary school? Well, I actually always wanted to go to culinary school, probably since I was... Um, a freshman in undergraduate. um, And my family was not super supportive um, of my idea to do that. Um, I had always been a really high achieving student when I was younger. And I guess my parents just assumed that meant I needed to get some kind of advanced degree. And so I went to school forever and ever and ever because I never quite found something I really liked to do. Um, because I wanted to do this and I think it just kind of, um, came to a conclusion when I was in my field and I could no longer blame that I, you know, cause I, the whole time I was in law school, everyone said, you know, oh, it's totally different when you're practicing, just give it a chance, this, that, and the other. And, you know, when I was finally at my quote unquote dream job, which was the best thing I could have envisioned for myself in that field. And, you know, I was getting paid pretty well and the people I worked with were nice to me and wasn't that difficult. Uh, and I just, I was miserable. Like I just hated it. And I felt like, you know, if I didn't know what I'd rather do instead, I probably could have stayed there. But in my heart, like the whole time I really knew I really liked cooking. I mean, that's what I would do every weekend. And when I got home from work, it was something I would get excited about. And, um, I think if I didn't have an idea in mind of what I'd rather be doing, I might still be doing that. But I thought, you know, and then at, on top of that, at the same time, I actually had a lot of health issues going on and I was having to change my diet. Um, and, you know, part of the inspiration of becoming an attorney in the first place was to try to help people. And um, I really thought, oh, geez, there's probably other people struggling with all this diet changing nutrition stuff this really sucks like maybe um i could go to culinary school and like learn how to make healthy food not as gross and um that would be a service so um that was kind of my idea that helped motivate me to just go ahead and give it a spin so what was that dream job that you thought you had or you had but changed um i was working for um the city university of new york it's like you know higher ed administrative, like I wanted to do kind of public education, like law reform type stuff. And I was in the biggest public higher ed institution in the country. And like I said, it was well paying. Everybody there was nice to me. I, everything was fine about it, but it just, you know, every day is reading and writing legal documents. And if you've ever read a legal document. Uh, I mean, there's no amount of money that would make you want to do that every day of your life. Like it's awful. It's so boring. So I was just like, you know, I'm someone that's always been a little bit more, as you could probably even see, like I'm all over the place. Like I need a job where I'm 
active, like on my feet, I get bored easy. Like I need a schedule where it's a little more switched up. Like I'm not a nine to fiver by any stretch. I'm not a morning person. These are things that I don't think was ever, no one ever sat me down when I was like 18 and said, think about your orientation. Are you a day or a night person? Are you a this or that? It was always like focusing on the end result of a career choice. Like, you know, what impact do you want to make? Not like, Hey, day to day, are you into these tasks? Like, I don't mind like chopping up vegetables. Like I don't mind, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, some there's days where my back hurts and I'm like, wow, I'd really like to go to the chiropractor right now. But, um, I like the day-to-day stuff that I have to do as a chef. Like, and that is part of what I wanted to talk to you about today, about how to kind of design your work in a way that you enjoy it. Cause it may not be that you don't like an industry. It may be like, Hey, these hours are terrible. This client is terrible, but you know, with legal, it was really any legal work. I just didn't like it. It probably wasn't very creative either. You didn't have a creative outlet with that law, right? Exactly. And it's also, it's all about like sitting in a desk, staring at a computer all day. And I am way ADD to the max. Like I have to be multitasking and doing things. And, you know, I just, you know, it was really hard to maintain focus on something that boring all day. Like I was pretty good at it, but it was really like, it was just a a different kind of stress. It's like when you're at a job that you really hate and you're staring at the clock, like, is it five yet? It was that kind of stress, not like chef stress where I'm like, I don't even have time to look at the clock because I'm doing 17 things. Right. It, go, it flies by, you know, and that's a different type of stress. And I actually prefer that than being bored. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm not good with that. So then you decided to go to culinary school. What did the family think? What did friends, what did your coworkers think when you were at the, the law firm there or the legal? I didn't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was like pretty much like gone by the time any of them knew what happened. Um, I which was awkward because the last couple months I was there, I was like lying to everybody um, about oh I'm sick because <laughs> I I didn't want to look people in the eye because like I knew what I was up to. Um, and then I feel like my parents disowned me for a few months, but I think once they realized I wasn't getting over it, they. Um, eventually kind of came around. I think once they saw me still doing it a few years later and making enough money to pay all my bills and that I was still happy doing it, I think they kind of, okay, all right, you know, we're on board with this. Um, um, I think their concerns were more about my financial well-being than anything. Um, My friends were probably the most supportive group, you know, and, um, I think with that too, I think people were just kind of like, is she going to stick with this or is this going to be another thing she does for like a year and then, you know, wants to do something else. Mm-hmm. So now how, how did you pick Johnson and Wales, specifically the Miami campus to go to school from you? I guess you were in New York at the time. Yeah, I went and visited the Providence campus in December and I was like, oh dear. So, um, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> too much snow, cold. It was so cold. Um, I I visited a couple other schools as well. And like I said, with some of my health issues, I had a lot of like thyroid stuff going on. And I was I was really struggling with keeping my body temp like regulated. So I was freezing all the time. And I couldn't imagine going anywhere more cold than New York at that point. And I had already lived in Miami. Um, I went to university in Miami for half of my undergrad. So I was pretty familiar with Miami and um, Johnson and Wales had a campus there and they had a much better program for people changing careers. And I, cause I wanted, you know, I was like, well, I'm going to go to culinary school. I want to go to a decent one, you know? Mm-hmm. And I looked at all of the quote unquote decent culinary schools. And, you know, some of these schools, they're, it, what a scam, you know, I called like CIA and they're like, Oh, so yeah, uh, your credits from NYU, we don't want to transfer your English and math. You're going to have to pay to retake. Wow. Like freshman, like basic ed requirements. And I was like, um, no. (laughs) So uh, Jonathan and Wales was like a little bit more realistic. And they're like, hey, you're going to have to take all the culinary 
you know, you'll take the culinary uh, classroom type stuff like business and nutrition. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I want that. But I'm not going to retake English when I already paid to take that at NYU. Like, what are you nuts? Like, so they transferred in all the regular required courses. Yeah. So I was like, well, thank you for that. So um, that saved a lot of money. Um, and it was, it was, that was kind of like a no brainer. I, I don't even feel like I, I mean, I, they, they, and they're just, they're just their attitude about it too. It was kind of like, well, uh, you know, we're, I, I was like, yeah, I already don't like your attitude. Bye. So <laughs> <laughs> like, go away. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm happy with, you know, the choice I had and the fact they had a campus that was somewhere nice, warm, yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sunny. So like, yeah, that was easy. So tell me about that transition. You already had a law degree, an undergrad degree, you're not the typical student at that time. You're an older student, you're on campus. What'd you think? What was it like? I mean, coming from law school to now you got 18 year old culinary students right out of high school. How was that? It was awkward. Um, I I did. I really liked that I was finally in school for something I actually wanted to be in school for. It was like I never had a, a educational experience like that before. I was just so used to like disliking school. Um, you know, I had a, a handful of classes in college that I thought were really interesting, but like every day in clutter school, I was like, woo, like some. You know, I was pretty tired just based on what my health was doing at that point. So some days I probably was a, it was a little muted, but I, I was really excited to learn what I was learning. And I felt like I was finally that nerdy kid that just had like a lot of questions and like, you know, in my other educational experiences, I tended to be the kid in the back that was like half asleep or like didn't show up at class. And, um, you know, so it was, it was kind of cool being someone that was like really motivated and actually cared about what I was doing. Um, on the other hand, being there with a bunch of younger students, I felt like I got bullied, like I was in junior high school. And I was like, really sad, like about it, because I was just like, like I said, I was really struggling with my health at that point. I mean, I remember one day in particular, I think I was in like the beverage class or something. And I got a call from my doctor that they're like, oh, we think you might have a brain tumor now. And I was like, what? Whoa. And it was just like really heavy news to get in the middle of class. And then I've got like these like, you know, 18 year old kids like picking on me because they think I'm vegetarian or something. And I was like, <laughs> what is going on right now? Like, please, like, you know, like, so there was, there was aspects I really liked about it. But, you know, there, there were some that I was just like, wow, I feel I just want to get along with people. And I, for, I forgot that dynamic. Now, the, cl the classes you thought were better, is that because they were less theory, more hands-on, more practical, a lot of it? You, were, you know, is, was it that component to it? Or was it just because of the subject matter was just... It was just the subject matter. I just really, like, I always wanted to understand more of the science behind cooking. Because even, even growing up, like, when I was in, like, junior high school, I'd maybe... Um, you know, stay home from school sick. And we didn't have the food network then. So it was like the learning channel. We had like Julia Child or the the Chinese guy and that was it. But I would sit there and watch and I'm like, wow, you can make your own pasta. And it was like a revelation. But like, you know, I didn't, you know, they don't go too far in depth explaining like all the chemistry stuff behind the scenes and why you do what you do. And so you don't really ever get to a place where you feel you can be creative because you don't really understand why you're doing what you're doing if you're not following a recipe. And so it's really exciting for me to learn that. It's so empowering because I'm like, oh, wow, I could take that and apply it here and here and here. And, um, you know, even especially, like I said, with doing people with special diets and stuff, like you, you kind of have to do that. So, um, yeah, it was really it was cool to like learn, oh, that's why that didn't work or that's, you know, how I could do this different. And, you know, I, that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Like no one ever told me any of that. Like I never had any clue what I was doing. I was following recipes and the food would come out good, but you know, I didn't feel like it was okay to just do whatever I wanted with something. Um, did you have a favorite class going through that? You only had to go one year, year and a half, correct? Because you already had a degree. That's what they have. Yeah, it was like a, a, a really, really long year. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, honestly, there were quite a few that I really liked. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I really didn't like. I'm the only one I can really think of that didn't uh, work out so well for me was mainly based on the instructor and 
I don't think I was the only one feeling that that particular instructor was a little difficult to work with um, and had a little too high of expectations for what we could do on the schedule that we were on. But um, e even the information I learned, there was good info. I just felt like it was, you know, a little too, you know, I wasn't sleeping to like try to get some of the assignments done and stuff. And, you know, it was, it was crazy because I'm a highly motivated student. I'm a, I'm studious. I'm like, how are, what is the expectation? A lot of these kids are 18. Like they're not <laughs> able to do this, I'm sure, because they're probably drinking or something. And I'm definitely not, and I still can't do it. So. So talk about that a little bit more, because the listeners probably think culinary school is just you go cook and make your lunch and eat it. But they don't realize that in these degree programs, there's academics, even in the lab classes, there's an academic component. Maybe from a student point of view, or, you know, especially with your background and perspective on, you know, going to other schools, what is the level of rigor? What is the level of work and the academics that someone would have to do? I, I thought it was kind of hard at certain parts, like just... Not necessarily like, um, I don't know that it required as much brain power necessarily, but it was just as much work. I mean, there were, there were definitely mornings where I was exhausted, you know, and you got to show up and look right. And I'm just like, I'm used to a regular college program where you can like roll out of bed, maybe come late and be half awake. And there you've got to be like, right, like on the ball. Um, and I was just like, whoa, this is like the military. Whoa, this is rough for me. Like, I'm, you know, I'm used to my little lawyer job where I roll in at 1030 with my coffee and I check my email for an hour and all of a sudden it's like, okay, let's go kids line up. And I'm like, whoa, like my posture's not right. I'm a mess. Like, um, 7am lineup, right? Check your uniform. Let's go. <laughs> that was the hardest part for me. Cause I was, I was always that kid that's, I mean, that's part of what attracts me to this industry is I can work in the evenings and, you know, when at my comfort level and I'm just like, whoa, yeah, I'm not, that's not me. I'm not the one who's like bright eyed and bushy tailed at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, but yeah, there was, you know, it, and it was like a hard day, like a lot of physical work all day. And, you know, I, you know, by the time you get home and then you have all this like writing assignments and things like that. I mean, it was a lot to do. Like I was tired a lot of the time and I know I wasn't the only one like, and you know, even talking to the, some of the younger students, it's a lot, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think it was worth it. And I, I don't think there was a whole lot of work I did that was complete busy work and like useless, you know, it was definitely all stuff I wanted to know. And I understand that my program was kind of intended to be like, hurry up and get it done in, in a year. Um, but it, yeah, it was a lot of information to cram in there. What advice would you give to someone? If someone came up to you and said, I want to go to culinary school first, would you tell them to go or if it's, if it's worth it or return on investment? And two, if you did, what would you tell them to know ahead of time? Is there anything that, you know, Hey, you should do this or you should know that, or you should be prepared for this. I feel like as someone who's was an expert for a while at going to school, I would tell anybody going to any sort of program, um, the same things I told you before, just about being really clear about like what the day-to-day -day work in that industry is about um, and have a really clear vision of like what sort of work you might want to like, you know, cobble out of that. And if it makes any financial sense to you to even do that, I know after I graduated, um, I did a business plan for a more restaurant oriented situation. And I was like, guess what? I'm not going to make enough money off this to be worth all that effort. And I scrapped it. And I was like, I'm going to have to figure out, you know, a different way to meet my financial goals because yeah, that's not going to work. And I feel like if half the people actually sat down and had an honest conversation with themselves about, you know, what am I suited to? What is my personality suited to? What am I looking to get out of this um, career situation? You know, what are my income goals? What are my hours per week availability? Like, sit down and be honest with yourself. Like, what is that? Does that degree further you toward that goal? Um, or are you just spinning wheels because you don't know what you're doing? And um, I feel like people would save themselves a lot of money if they, and, and a lot of time, if, if you sit down and have that conversation first before you're like, okay, I'm in school because I'm 18 and that's what you're supposed to do. Um, so I, I think that would be really useful. 
And this career also gives you the opportunity to test it out first. You could go work in a restaurant. You could go work in a hotel. Whereas, you know, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, it's not like you're really going to go check it out first. So, you know, that would probably be some advice is like, go find out what it's like because this may be your life. Yeah, that's a good point. Also with culinary, one good thing. I mean, even people that don't end up working in the industry, that's not a bad skill set to have just for your life. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm never going to be sorry that my dinner is better now. <laughs> um, you know, like I, there are so many career fields. You can go to school for like dental assisting and I don't really know what you're going to do with that. Um, that's going to improve your life a whole lot if you don't end up doing that. So, um, I think culinary is a great skill just to have. So I, I kind of felt like that going in, I'm like, well, if this ends up being another waste of time, like, I love it. So I'm never going to be sorry that I went to school for one more year after I wasted however many years in school. Yeah. Good point. But I think, I think it's helpful to also realize like, you know, you don't have to end up in the stereotypical job in your industry, you know, and there's a lot of ways to be creative about like, how can I apply this information to, to make the sort of business or job that I want, you know, and I think we're so you know, the orientation is so much around, well, what is the employer looking for? You know, a lot of people, I think they assume they need to, you know, open a restaurant if they want to be a chef um, or they assume they have to go work for somebody else. And I, I think there are other alternatives and um, some of them you can make a lot more money too. So I think if people were a little bit more open-minded and honest with themselves about like what would work for them. Like, I don't want to work in a restaurant where I got to cook the same thing every day. That sounds really boring to me. Um, You know, I also don't want to work that hard for no money. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I got to come, I got to be more creative and come up with some ideas. My health can't support working 80 hours a week, you know, grinding it out as a slave for some billionaire family, which I accidentally tried. Um, (laughs) But um, don't do it. I don't recommend. But, um, you know, when you're 20, maybe you can hack that for a few months before you burn out. But, um, you know, I had to find a way to make all my physical needs work with my financial needs and um, in a way that I wasn't going to get bored. Um, and I feel like I've cobbled together a good situation for myself, but it, t- it did take a little while. Good. And tell us about that. What did you do when you get out of school and what, what was your focus and how has that changed? And where are you, where are you now? What are you, what are you doing and using that skill set and, and that career path? Well, when I graduated and I think I got real about like, oh, I have student loans and I have this and that, I'm not going to be able to work for $12 an hour as a line cook. So I got to figure something out here. And, um, you know, a couple of the things that kept coming up as suggestions or I thought of that would earn me a similar income to what I had before was the private chef industry. And also a lot of people were pushing me to go into like food media. They're like, oh, well, you're cute and you cook. And I'm like, okay, that's here. Here's the thing. Like, I don't like being on TV. I like cooking and I'm an introvert. I am not like wanting to be any more the center of attention. Like, I don't even like when I do these parties and people come in and are asking me about the food. I'm kind of like, don't watch me cook, you know? Um, (laughs) So yeah, that's not for me. So I was like, okay, well, private chefing, great. And, um, you know, a lot of the agencies and stuff, it's like, okay, well, where's your like 30 years of experience, like in a Michelin star restaurant and like this and that. And I'm like, oh gosh, like, I don't know, you know? And I felt like such a fraud, but like, Um, you know, I really, I really set my focus on it. And I think, um, having that I was kind of marketing myself as like specializing and doing all these diets that I had been uh, trying to follow and that kind of set me apart a little bit, um, because that hadn't really become a, a mainstream trend yet. Um, so for that one client that was like, yeah, I need to eat gluten-free, you know, dairy free, sugar free, they, you know, I was the candidate that the agencies would say, Oh, well, this girl, she does that. Um, And it was really funny. Um, I remember I had read all these little manifestation books about, you know, starting your own business. And it was all that cheesy stuff, like, well, write down the amount of money you want to make and all this like pie in the sky stuff. And I, I was sitting at home, like, you know, like peeing myself. Cause I'm like, am I going to be able to pay my bills? Like, cause I don't have a job right now. 
And there was like a good like two or three months where I was kind of freaking out and maybe delusional. And um, one day I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to Whole Foods and get a smoothie. I can't stress about this anymore. <laughs> and I went and I got, I got my cell phone ring and it was like this person was like, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so's personal assistant and we found your resume online. I was like, am I being punked? Like, what? Huh? <laughs> Like you found me, I didn't apply for this. And like, it's like this person who's famous that I've heard of. And I'm like, you're kidding, right? Cause I have like zero experience, you know? And they're like, yeah, why don't you come audition and this and that? And I'm like, okay. So I, I remember still being in the grocery store before I went over there and I'm like shaking. Cause I'm like, this is, they're going to find out I'm terrible and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and um, <laughs> like, I, I cooked and like, it was so weird because after I sat down with him and he's like, you know, this was great and we want to offer you the job and the amount of money we're going to offer you. It was the exact amount of money I wrote down in my like hokey dokey little goal setting thing. And I was like, okay, that's freaky. Wow. Um, so like the more, um, I feel like positions I took, it was like, I'm more kept like refining what I wanted to do. And I remember my last position I had in South Florida, I was there for like three years with one client. And by the time I was looking for that client, I was so picky. I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I don't want to work weekends and I really don't want to work more than like 25 hours a week, but I want to make like this much money. <laughs> I'd rather, not, you know, I really only want to do super healthy, organic food and, you know, yada, yada. He can't be creepy and I don't want anyone being nasty or rude to me. And I just had so many little like, like things on the list and the agency was like, okay, honey, we'll call you. Like keep screaming, <laughs> you know? And I still remember like them too. Like one day I'm at the coffee shop working on my, you know, writing project and the phone rings and they're like, uh, I think your client just called. Like it was like exactly everything I asked for. And cause you know, not that many chefs were looking for something that was quote unquote part time at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and vegetarian ish. And I floated right to the top. They're like, oh, this, this is exactly for you. And, you know, part time being like 30 hours a week. But that was what I wanted right then for my health uh, stuff and everything. And it was perfect. And I stayed there and I was really happy there. That was the first time I ever was like, oh, so I waited for a position that was like really, really, really what I wanted. And guess what? It worked out because every time I've ever settled, it doesn't work out. It blows up in my face. And then I have some gap on my resume because I took something I knew wasn't a good fit. Um, not to say there aren't moments where it's like, okay, I have no money. I need to take something like now. Like I've done that before um, in an emergency. But I mean, if I can afford to wait out for the thing that's really what's for me, then I'm going to do that. Um, and I, I think just being really, really clear about what is and isn't going to work for me has helped me now with my business that, you know, I have clients call me all the time and I can screen on the first phone call, not worth my time to even go back and forth with this person, like already seems stressful. Um, they're really too worried about the budget or, you know, they seem like they don't really know what they want or, um, you know, and I can be a little more picky about that now. Before I remember I was always coming from this place of like desperation of like anybody sure. Yeah. What do I got to do to, you know? And now I'm like, no, I'm like, this is what it is. Like we could work together or not, but that's right. what I'm doing over here. And you can let me know if that's what you need, but, um, well, you have the experience now and the confidence too. You've done it long enough where it's not like that first time we had a little bit of, I guess, imposter syndrome or like, I can't cook, but now, you know, and yeah. <laughs> Moving to Savannah was definitely interesting because it's not the same as um, South Florida where private chefing isn't really as much of a thing here as far as, you know, people aren't hiring a full-time chef. So um, I do um, some people's weekly food and I do a lot of higher end events, a lot of times for tourists, which has become interesting with the whole COVID 
um, situation. But I had to kind of switch up what I was doing because the market here didn't support me finding a full time private chef job. So would think Miami would have a better clientele for private chefs than maybe Savannah. Definitely. So that's why I I moved here. I think I was just kind of getting a little bit kind of like bored with South Florida. And I, I just guess I needed a challenge because I was like, let me move somewhere where they don't hire private chefs. Nobody eats healthy at all. You know, um, <laughs> let's go, let's do this. Like I had, you know, part of the marketing is explaining even what I do, um, explaining what health is. Um, you know, so I was like, wow, this will be fun, you know, and there's no agencies here to help me. Wonderful. Right. So, yeah. So I, yeah, I was a little stressed out when I first moved here and, um, I felt like it was a really good affirmation because I don't even think I was here. I probably had been looking for work for like a month, you know, and I would like, like, it was like the universe was giving me little, like, hang in there, kid, you know, because it would be like, I'd get a call from my agent for like, oh, Will Smith's there shooting Gemini, man. You want to like go meet with them? And I'm like, oh, thank God, something, you know? <laughs> and, um, but like, it, because it took, like a while for me to meet enough people like word of mouth just to get you know get a few you know stable clients and i had somebody i was working with um doing a similar thing that had been here a little bit longer than me for a little while but you know eventually it it, it was fine but i did i did have to kind of you know wrap my head around people don't hire for that and but the people that are looking to eat healthy here the good news is there's like no competition um i know when people um come to like i have there are more chefs up in hilton head um i do a lot of parties i'm doing the party app tomorrow's in hilton head there's more um competition with chefs up there but there's also a lot more work um but savannah as soon as somebody's coming to downtown savannah for a party or tybee island I'm like the only private chef they can find to come do like a dinner. There aren't that many other ones here. So like I do, for whatever reason, this area is a huge destination for bachelor and bachelorette parties. Wow. I don't know why, but so I feel like almost every weekend I do a dinner for um, some pre-wedding situation. So I have like parties of like 15 to 20 people that'll have like a nice like four course dinner at their Airbnb or their house that they're renting. Um, and they have me come. Sometimes I do birthdays and stuff like that, but a lot of them are the the bridal type stuff. Sure. I have a bachelorette party tomorrow night. I have a bachelor party next weekend. And then the following weekend, I have another bachelorette party. That's good. So there's probably a lot of listeners or students that want to go to culinary school that are interested in being a private chef. So maybe you could share the pros and cons of being a private chef or, you know, what's some of the mistakes that you made along the way that they might be, you know, now be aware of. Um, well, I definitely like, you know, the way that I do things now, I really get to work on my own schedule you know, I take clients or I don't based on, you know, this is when I want to work. This is how much time I have available to work. You know, the type of clients I work with, like most of the ones I have now, you know, I justify charging a lot based on, you know, most of these clients have like a very special need that, you know, I have one client now who's on this really intensive, like migraine diet they got at like Johns Hopkins or something. And, you know, he's got to eat very, very, um, clean. Um, and I have, um, another client that they're kind of like here hiding from COVID and they're kosher and just like super healthy. And, um, so, you know, I kind of like, I like working with these people though, because it's like, they can't meet their needs just going out to eat somewhere in town here. Like, I like that I get to like make their life worth living like this just seeing this guy that was so sick, you know, that he's flying all over the country going to hospitals and I show up to bring his food and he's just like smiling ear to ear, like, thank you for like, I can eat something and not feel like I'm going to die. And, you know, it's just like a really like nice feeling that like I'm helping someone to like enjoy their life again and like get healthy. Cause I know what that's like and it could be really awful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my health is okay now, but like I was really sick for like seven or eight years and it was miserable. And I know what it's like to be, you know, there's a lot more products now for people, but then there definitely was not. Um, but like, I like being able to work with people. I had another client, um, recently he had also health issues. And, you know, when I went to last time I saw his wife and she's like, all his blood work is back to normal and his doctors are so happy. And, you know, this is just great. And, you know, it, it like makes me feel good that, you know, these people are not only enjoying their food, but they're getting their, you know, to meet their other goals that they have, um, and not be, um, struggling so hard. So I, that's one important part of what I'm looking for in a client is like a sense of like purpose for me, like where I feel like I'm really helping or, you know, even just having a client, my last client in Miami was healthy, but like, he just really enjoyed the food. Like he was just really into it and just having someone that appreciated it. It just made me feel good every day going to work. Like it, it mattered, like what I was doing. And, um, you know, that's important for me. And I know when I first started, I was so insecure about like, I'm a lawyer. They're going to find out like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you know, that I, I was more kind of any client that would take me on was fine, you know, and, um, you know, some of the positions, it was just way too many hours. Like I didn't have any work-life balance and I was not super happy after a period of time, like, and, you know, that would start to come out. So I think being honest about that and like, is that going to work for me? Um, Maybe if I was 20, but not now. Um, so a student that wanted to get into this or someone, a graduate, they should really kind of set some you know, best parameters or goals and say, this is what I want. And this is what I'm looking for. Like, kind of like what you did wrote down how much you need to make and what your philosophy, I guess. Yeah. Like having some good boundaries, I think is really helpful because a lot of these um, positions, they will kind of like, you're signing your life over, like you gotta be there. And I think it's really important from day one. Like, I think you can negotiate better boundaries once all the bad habits aren't already in motion. You know, I think clients take it a lot better when you're very clear up front, like what is and isn't going to be okay with you. Then six months into a working relationship with a client, all of a sudden, you know what? I can't travel on the holidays. You know what? And you kind of knew in your heart, you were never going to be okay with working on Christmas when you wanted to be with your kids or whatever. And it's like, you know, um, I think it's tempting to yes, somebody to death at an interview, but like, you know, I think being honest really early. And I think when you're new, sometimes you don't even know that it is going to be a problem. You kind of tell yourself, oh, yeah, that'll be fine. And then you're doing it and you're like, mm. <laughs> so it, it may, t it may take a little while to learn that. But I think for me, I kind of knew, you know, early on, like in my gut, like, oh, this person seems like pretty like critical and just like, um, how am I going to feel all the time working with a client who's just never happy? <laughs> Like I, I had a client like that and it wasn't me. It was like the whole staff. It was just constant. Like just, it was kind of like some kind of stereotype out of a movie that I think she was just kind of like bored or something and just picking on the staff like all day. And it was like, yeah. I don't know. It's just not it's like kind of a hostile work environment. I'm like, you could pay me whatever you want, but like just to thank you would be good for me. You know, I just, so um, maybe it's certain people, they don't care so much um, about how they're treated at work or, you know, maybe to them, it'd be more important, you know, the vacation time or um, some other benefit. But, you know, for me, my day to day comfort level at work is important. So how did you know how to set the rates? What do you do to set rates? How does someone know how much money they could make or how much they should charge? Do they look at the local competition. Do they already have a number in mind? Do they have to do food costing? How do they come up with that? Or you come up with that? Um, when I first started, I did go on Google and, and look up private chef salaries and um, hourly rates and, you know, try to kind of 
be honest with myself about my experience level and like what I was bringing to the table versus like my competition. And then also, yeah, your geographic area is kind of a big deal. Um, as far as like what you can expect. Um, so yeah, having that all in mind going in, um, is great. And also knowing what your needs actually are, because I can be like, Hey, I'd really like to lowball all the other chefs, but like, if I can't pay my bills, like that's not helpful either. So, um, you know, and if, you know, I need to know that I'm going to be in an industry where I can be a success and, you know, that I can meet my financial goals, like, so, um, like I said, like, since I moved to Savannah, I've had to kind of maybe reduce prices for my regular clients because people just aren't used to that kind of a service. It's more of a luxury service to begin with, but a lot of tourists I get that come from out of town, I can like make up the difference because people are coming down from New York to them. I'm a bargain, you know? Um, right. but, um, when I do parties, I tend to more, I have a, pretty good sense at this point from doing them for so long, what my food costs are going to be when I'm pricing out a party, you know, um, as far as I feel out how big of a pain it's going to be for me. And there might be a slight, uh, secret upcharge for that. But, um, I, I have a pretty good sense of how long things take now and what my time is worth. And I try to, um, I think it just comes with experience knowing how much of my time is going to be used by something. And I try to be good about multitasking. Like if I know I have my weekly people and this party and, you know, let's try to make one trip to the grocery store for all of this. And let's not make mistakes when I'm making the list. So I don't have to go back. Um, you know, just be very organized and try to really minimize having to waste time on things. And I can give people a better price that way. Now, do most people charge by the hour or do they charge by the job or by the meal or how would they, they figure that into it? Um, I think it depends how you're marketing and um, where you're getting your clients. Certain, certain websites like want you to set a per person rate on a, a party, depending if you're using that site. Um, and I personally know a lot of chefs don't, we don't do that because if you have a five person party, there's going to be some base level that you're going to have to pay, you know, and people are going to call in and be like, well, I want the per person rate for five people. And I'm like, that's not worth my time to come out to your party. Yeah. Sorry. You know? <laughs> There's a minimum. <laughs> yeah. Like the difference between 15 and 17 people. Okay. But like, um, yeah, no, there's a minimum. And a lot of these websites, it's like they are trying to cater to a bunch of different services and they don't really understand it. So, um, that can be a little bit of an issue, but, um, I don't, I try with my marketing, I don't put out set menus or set pricing. I kind of purposely market everything is like, Hey, this is custom tailored to your preferences and your dietary needs. Therefore expect that it's going to be a little pricey. Like I kind of just have that out there to begin with. And it filters out all the people that are going to be like, whoa, that's expensive, you know, are already up front. And I've kind of made myself okay in my heart with that. Because like, if I want to do volunteer work, I do that separate. I don't consider part of my job as like being nice to people. You know, I have my business over here. And then it's like over here, if there's people that can't afford a chef or a nutrition educator that need it, I'll help you over here. But I don't want it in my brain get the wires crossed that this is a work thing. Cause then I'll get resentful because I'm like, I'm getting paid how much to this isn't worth it. And if I just tell myself, I'm just doing this to be nice for free. Great. Like I have no issues with it, but you know, for the service that I charge for, I'm not going to give this person some kind of way discounted rate. And I just, I don't, it doesn't work like that. Or I haven't found that it works for me to do that. <laughs> So how would someone break into it? Someone wants to be a private chef. They're working in a restaurant on the line now, or they're just getting out of culinary school, whatever. They're like, this is my dream. How would you advise them? What would you say they do first? Um, I think it's a good idea to network with the different agencies. Um, I mean, ideally locate yourself in an area where there are agencies like South Florida is great. California um, is great. New York, great. Um, and you know, get your resumes to them, get their feedback. Like a lot of these agents are like 
pretty happy to tell you, you know, what doesn't look great on your resume or like what, 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 what clients are coming in that like what needs they're trying to fill. So, you know, if they're saying, you know, we really need someone who's open to this kind of flexibility in their schedule, or we're really looking for someone who has this kind of uh, culinary background, like you can kind of get a sense like what in your resume needs help. Um, they could probably help you with uh, fees too, or right? what to charge or how much you're going to make. So then that would help with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they are pretty good at giving you a clue of like what a particular like if you're looking for a more full-time position, you know what that's worth in the culinary world. Um, there are definitely positions where you can make a ton of money, but I'm, you know, as far as like your work life balance, like that's maybe not so great. So um, I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind, how important that is to you. And um, there are definitely clients though, that are looking for people part-time or that are, more reasonable with the hours and days that they're expecting. Um, there are people that are looking for someone seasonally. So maybe you can like work really, really hard for a few months in the summer in the Hamptons and then be done for the year. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's definitely people that do that. There's people that work in the yachting industry and have, you know, months on and months off. Um, and some provide room and board as well. So they might even be living. Yeah. Well, that's another thing you have to consider. And for me, I've been offered that situation and I'm like, hey, that sounds like a really great deal up front because you're like free rent. And then like you get there and you're like, oh, wait, I live at my job and I already work a lot. So like you're pretty much always going to be working if you're there because it's like, oh, there's Chef Amber again. Hey, I need a snack. You know, it's like, no. Like, um, so I, I think you've got to kind of be honest with yourself. And it really is so dependent on the particular client you're working with. Like I've worked with some people that are just like amazing and super flexible and like really, you know, nice people. And some people that just, are, you know, outrageous. And, and a lot of times the agencies know, you know, and so that's another important thing. Instead of getting locked into, let me please the agent by yes, yes, yes. Like I started being like, how's this client? Like, instead of wondering about myself, like being like, can you tell me a little more about them? Are they difficult? And, um, the agents a lot of times will be honest with you. Well, yeah, this this is the seventeenth chef. <laughs> you know, play time we try to place a chef this six month period, and they could be a little bit critical. And so you kind of are okay. I'm not wasting my time on that interview because that's not, you know. And I think the more you talk to the agents and you get comfortable they know what's a good fit for you too, like based on what you're looking for. So calling them and having a real conversation and telling them and, you know, and then you start to get a sense of like, is there anything about my resume that would stand out to a prospective client? Sometimes it's something as simple as like, oh, we see you really like sailing and, you know, these clients are really into that. And, you know, you, 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 you find common ground on something you know, like if someone saw in my resume, oh, you used to be an attorney. Well, we're kind of thinking and maybe the chef might take on some um, household manager responsibilities a little bit. That actually might work. Like, you know, you don't know what from your background might appeal to them depending on the position. And I think sometimes, you know, people that come from a different um, career background, they might have some skills that they don't think is relevant to chefing. But for that particular client might be exactly, Oh, that'd be great. Like mm -hmm. now besides agencies, how else would you market yourself or how do people do you, I guess you have a website. Do you, is it, do you, is that how you get your name out there? Or? Um, yeah, here, there are no agencies here. So, um, I have my, I used to have my own website, but with, um, all the search engine stuff and everything. I just, I don't think that I could afford financially to keep up with making that something people were going to encounter, especially here, because a lot of the clients I get are coming from out of town. You have to have a nationally recognized website for these people to find you. So they're finding private chefs on like something like Thumbtack or like websites like that. Um, um, there's another one called like take a chef or something like that. Um, 
but those are the national websites that will pop up for them. So you got to have like a listing on there. Um, for local people here, having like a Facebook or Instagram page, um, that's where a lot of people local here find me. I have a Google place like set up and I'll get messages on there. And then just networking in the community with, you know, I, you know, there's certain organizations here, like, you know, I think Savannah Vegetarians knows about me and a couple other places. So if they have people coming there, do you know someone who could do a party? They'll send them to me. Like maybe wine, wine shops or gourmet markets or something like that, having them, someone shows up and asks. Oh yeah. And I'm, I'm in Whole Foods. Like, let's be real, like daily, you know, we have a fresh market too. And like, yeah, they know who I am because I'm always there. Um, so it helps to just like have more of a relationship. Like if you're going to buy seafood and just kind of throwing it out there. Oh yeah, I'm a private chef, da, 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 you know, and then people, if you hear anybody, yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's good to just have business cards um, on you. When I first moved here, I went to a, a lot of horrible, uncomfortable networking events, you know, just meeting people in the community and, you know, you do a couple parties here and there and eventually you bump into oh, you know, we, we run this organization locally. It'd be great to have you for a party. But I get a lot of people now that are referrals from other people that I've done a party for. Sure. One thing about working with a lot of tourists is it's not a lot of repeat business, but I almost feel like that's like a totally separate part of my business from the local stuff that I do. So you could probably have business cards or something. So if you're doing an event and someone wanted it, then you could get the re yeah. new business from that. I d I do that. I've I've definitely I always get pitched to to do like, hey, will you do free food at a table at our event? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, I I moved away from that because that never for me. I don't know. Maybe it works for somebody, but I I don't feel like that's ever done anything for me. Um. But, um, I get a lot of offers like, Hey, want to provide free food at our event? I'm like, no, I don't know you. Bye. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, but I do, I do bring business cards. I do do networking events. I do my best to kind of be mindful of that. Like, I know I've gotten to a point now where I have enough business that I'm not like actively thinking about marketing most of the time. Um, at the beginning of COVID, I was kind of like freaked out because basically my whole party schedule for April and May, like flat out canceled immediately. And I was like, uh Oh, this is my busy wedding season time. And I kind of had a little mini panic mode, but, um, I think July things really started to pick up again and I've been really busy the last couple months, but I, I, I guess a good thing is I haven't really had to think hard about marketing for the last couple of years. So but when I first moved, you get established. Yeah, once I first moved here, though, I was business cards out at every event on Facebook. I'd go on the events page, what local events are happening tonight. Take my butt over there with some business cards and have a bunch of awkward conversations with people. Um, Do you have any any social media now that you will be comfortable sharing? I could put it in the show notes or something if someone wanted to look into you or see how you set yours up. Yeah, sure. I think the one that's most work oriented is my Facebook business page. It, um, it's, I think you search facebook.com slash chef Amber Marie, and it comes up saying clean cuisine. That's not a technically registered business name. That's just my Facebook business name, just to be clear about that. But um, I think someone else already trademarked that name for something similar, but um, that's what it looks like when you pull it up. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that in the, in the show notes too. So if someone's listening, they can't get to it right now. They can go back and look at it and just see what a, you know, a private chef uh, website or social media site kind of looks like. It's good to have like, especially if you're on social media like that, it's good to have keywords in your biography that people will search that will set you apart too. Like for example, I noticed um, as soon as I had a review on there of someone I did a bachelorette party for, I must have been coming up in the results for people searching for that. And then all of a sudden that became like my thing. I was like the bachelorette party girl or something. So I was like, wow, okay. So I so I started actively putting that in my marketing on purpose. And like now that's like a lot of my business. Good. So you were talking about certification and how it can be important as a private chef. Yeah. So 
I think like I was saying, the, um, the serve safe and all that can be really important. Um, you know, if you want to get access to any of these commercial kitchens and whatnot, the health department tends to oversee that. Um, they generally want to see that you have, you know, the base licensing, depending on what state you live in, um, there might be different rules, but, um, I think most of the clients that I have don't really ever see my resume. The agencies might see it. Um, if you're working with an agency, um, and if you don't have a lot of industry experience, it can probably benefit you to have more credentials and skills listed on your resume. Um, I think to maybe secure a first or second, you know, big position, it could be useful. Um, and I think you could decide for yourself um, what seems like more challenging, whether to go get maybe the restaurant or private chef experience they're looking for, or to go, you know, find another way to set yourself apart on your resume. Um, I think that with um, the private chef industry, it's kind of one of those things that once you've had a position in the industry and you have some experience, it's like, okay, you're legit now. And it's like, wait, what, what just happened? Cause you know, like nothing really happened, you know? Um, <laughs> But it's like it's like one of those. It's like you get one reference, and it's like all of a sudden you're um, you're good to go. Now, how does the um, agency get paid? How does their cut? How does that work? Is that a percentage? The client pay? You pay? Where does that fit in? Um, that could be interesting. I had a little dispute with one agency um, because the client is supposed to pay them before they hire you. Um, and the agency is supposed to do a pretty good job of making sure the client cannot contact you directly until that happens. Um, but I had a client go behind the agency's back to try to hire me, Wow, which was awkward. Um, and a lot of the agencies have you sign like a form that will say like, you're going to get in trouble if you let them do that. But quite honestly, if the agency is going to bungle a deal so badly that they're going to leave you unemployed um, because they didn't, negotiate well enough with this client, then I'm kind of like, I don't know if I feel super bad about that. But um, yeah, most of the times uh, you don't pay anything to the agency. Not that I'm aware of. There might be agents that do it that way, but most of them get paid, um, you know, like a finder's fee from the client. Good. So they really need you as the private chef because you're their product. Mm -hmm. Is there a question that I should have asked that I didn't that you want to talk about? I don't know. Do you, do you talk to a lot of chefs that work in the private chef side of things or? No, no you're the first. I, Cause I always kind of wonder like how much people actually in the industry know about it because most people that aren't in the industry have no clue like what I do at all. But I, I wonder if people, the more restaurant and academic oriented culinary world has any clue, like, cause they, it can, it's so variable. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think there really is like a, I mean, I think there's like the, like to me, the stereotypical job would be the 80 hour a week thing where you work with one family or, or on your boat or whatever you're doing. Um, and I've, I've done positions that are more similar to that. And then there are these things that are, um, you know, or then there's people that think I'm a caterer, which I'm not doing that either. So, um, there's this middle ground that I don't think people have any idea what that is um, <laughs> or how flexible or great it can be. Um, so, well, you might do a one, one dinner for someone, but then do you also like set up a meal for the whole week for them or a you know, you might go in and do one day of cooking and then leave them stuff that they reheat. I've had like every possible arrangement from clients where I've literally been there multiple times a day to cook for them. I've had clients where I'd make them dinner and leave them breakfast for the next day. Um, the one client I had for like three years, I would be there every night for dinner and leave a lunch for the next day while I was there. Um, and sometimes like some stuff for the weekend. Um, a lot of the clients I have now, I'll go one day a week and leave them food for a week or so. Um, and then if they have like a particular event, like where they're having company over, like I'll go to like serve the dinner 
but like if it's like family meal type stuff, then they're fine with serving themselves. Um, but it, it's totally client dependent what their priorities are. Some people really want the five star service with, you know, having everything plated at the table. And some people are just like, Hey, I just don't want to cook. So could you give them a range of what the possibilities are? I know that was skies wide open, but you know, if someone was listening to this thinking they're going to get into it and if they were going to charge hourly or for a job, you know, is it a couple hundred dollars, $400 a night? Is it, you know, a certain amount per hour, just so they have a rough idea. I know Savannah is different than Miami and I'm sure California. Um, well, like the party I'm doing tomorrow, like I said, I can tell you it's a bachelorette party. Um, I think I have like 17 girls coming and I think I'm charging them like 800, 850. And I would say like a general rule, probably the party will tip me like a hundred bucks or something on top of that. And then I've spent $200 on groceries. So subtract that out. And so what is that? Like probably like six or $700 probably take home for me. Um, for, yeah, like I have to do a little prep today and, you know, work tomorrow night. I mean, do a little shopping. Yeah. That's not, I mean, I did, I went and picked up some groceries yesterday. And like I said, I'll multitask that with my weekly, I have a couple weekly customers that live in a particular neighborhood here that I'll do all the shopping at one time. Great. So yeah, it's, it's uh, doable. I know some of the past students from Johnson and Wales that they're working on a lot of yachts and they're working on a lot of the mansions, private chefs there, and they're, they're doing, you know, thousand dollars a week and stuff like that. Just, you know, going in and cooking some dinners and stuff. So, you know, it can be, it can be a, a career choice. Oh, you can live in the dream. Like, I mean, I've had days where I was, uh, you know, I'm like, you know, up to my elbows in like <laughs> cookie dough. And I'm like, I'm getting paid like, $1,200 to do this. I was like, this is like some kind of four-year-old <laughs> fantasy or something, you know? And I was like, I can't believe this. And, you know, there's, and that's why I said it's important to uh, kind of get clear about what, what positions are going to end up making you resentful because, um, you know, I've definitely accidentally taken, uh, taken on something and then realized after the fact, oh, this is a lot more work than I planned on. Um, so I ask a lot more questions up front now, and I also disclose a lot more information up front um, about how it works and what the cost is before, you know, I've already wasted four hours talking to someone and, oh, yeah, that's too expensive. Okay, bye. Well, I, I, let me get that over with in the first 30 seconds of talking then. And there's things you want to get clear too, like who's cleaning, who's you know, busing, who's, uh, you know, all that stuff, shopping. So you want to make sure that no misunderstandings too. Yeah. I think, um, I've, I've met, um, several, a couple other people that do similar parties that I do. And I, one particular couple, it's a couple that I know it's a husband and wife that are chefs that do it. And they always were like, how are you able to serve and do it by yourself? And like, um, it's great now because my fiance is here. So as long as a bachelorette parties, I'm kind of on my own because I can't bring him. <laughs> but, um, you know, like the other, like last week, I think I had like a seven or eight course like meal with this group. And I was like, I don't know how I would have tried pulling off serving and plating all that myself if he wasn't there i probably <laughs> live and learn like and you don't realize till you're doing it that you're like i can't do this like what i thought i could this is <laughs> terrible so so as we come to the end of our chat today and before we wrap up is there any last minute advice or guidance that you want to leave with the listeners you know something that you want to share i think it's just really important that if you have an idea of what you want to do um, and you really like doing it, that it's probably a good idea to not listen to people that aren't in the industry or don't have experience doing what you want to do. Um, listening to all kinds of naysaying, for me, that was really destructive. And I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing or be happy if I listened to all those people. That said, it is important to do your research and make sure you're you know, that you have a path to the goals. Um, 
and that you get people in your life that can help you achieve them. But um, I think it's really important not to give up and settle for a situation um, that you know is not really what you want to do. I think that was really helpful because we don't really have a lot of the you know, private chefs, or I haven't had up to this point. So I think some of that knowledge will really resonate. Yeah, I want people to get that because I know that when I first graduated and was kind of floundering of how to make a decent living and stay in the industry and not default to something um, else again, um, it was like, you know, trying to come up with something that you can do. Um, I, I might have given up if I didn't, you know, continue to try to refine and, and be creative and, and find a way to make something else than like the, the basic couple of paths that you're suggested, you know, um, I know I had instructors in culinary school too, that like made fun of me, like, Oh, gluten-free vegan baking. What's that an oxymoron for her? And I'm like, actually, that's like the newest trend <laughs> in the industry. So like, good luck. I know you were ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, all right, like, you know, and I mean, if I would have listened to all that, I probably would have just went home and felt sorry for myself. But I think it's, it's just important to, you know, really be like, Hey, you know what? I really like doing this. And like, I'm really determined to find a way to make it work and to make the amount of money I need to make. Like, I don't have a, like, I'm a, a full grown adult. I don't live with my parents. Like I cannot live on $12 an hour. You know, I have to find another way to be successful. And I, I think it, it pushes you to, to have to, you know, ask for, you know, you have to grow as a person. Like you have to be like, I'm not super comfortable talking to people about money and especially asking them for, you know, especially if I feel like green, like, I don't want to be like, Hey, it's going to be a hundred dollars an hour. Like, you know, I feel stupid even saying that, but you have to learn skills about selling yourself and being more confident because if you don't even ask for what you want, you're definitely not going to get it. Right. That, that was hard for me. I never, I didn't come from a background where I was the person in control of my work life. It was always like, what can I do to please my employer? And I never had an orientation about interviewing them back like to see if it was going to work for me. And um, learning all that, I think, really helped me um, make this work. Did you have any mentors or anyone that kind of helped you, that took you under their wing or as you were in this in this part of the industry? Um, Not really. I'll say like I, I read a ton of books and I watched a ton of YouTube, like motivational stuff that was more just like general entrepreneur kind of stuff. And I did do one of those like score, like business classes uh -huh. that yep. helped me put together like a business plan for a restaurant. And it was, it was super valuable because I was like, I see how if I put together a clear plan, one thing that could happen is you could decide not to do that plan because it sucks, right? you know? And, um, and, and that really helped me because I think I might've had reservations if I just decided not to do it and I didn't really crunch the numbers, I might've always thought, well, what if I did that? I'm like, no, what if it would have been a disaster if I did that? Like, right. you know, I wouldn't have made any money and I would have been miserable. So yeah, you got to get it on paper and do that due diligence up front. Yeah. You did all the hard work though already. What about a, a book or a course on it so that you could then take your knowledge and share with others? Well, I do like doing the nutrition education stuff. Um, you know, I, I do give a uh, periodic like talks here on topics like being more mindful about your time and your food and yada, yada. And, um, I, I prefer cooking and hiding in my kitchen than talking to people, but I, I, do, <laughs> I do. That's why I offered to come on this is because I do want that information to get out there. Um, especially in this industry, I hear a lot of stereotypes, especially here in Savannah about, well, everybody's drunk and, you know, just people making excuses for themselves. And like, there's, you know, everything, you know, every job is a million hours a week. And, you know, that's just how it is. And I'm like, if you accept that for yourself, that's how it is. Like, right. it doesn't have to be, maybe that's the way for 90% of people that don't demand more for themselves. But, um, you know, that would have been for me too. And I would have given up because I would have been like, I didn't go to all this school to work in a line in a, you know, restaurant for someone else. Like that wasn't the point. So, um, but I could see how you could get stuck there. Yeah. 
But maybe you could t- team up with like Whole Foods or one of these other places and do like a little lesson or something for them at the same time promote your business with the health and the education. I've, d- I've done stuff like that. There's an organization here called Healthy Savannah that I've done work with and one called um, Mixed Greens. Um, I Like I said, I tend to do things like that as more of a service. Like I work with this childhood obesity prevention education. We have like an after school program here which isn't operating now because of COVID, but like I, you know, I do some community educational outreach type stuff um, that I just do, you know, there's like a Palmetto, like South Carolina plant eaters club that I went and talked at. Um, But yeah, I like, I like helping because this area, people don't know anything about any of the nutrition stuff. So that's all new information for them. But also for that reason, it hasn't really caught on, so yeah, it hasn't really led my business anywhere. You know, the five <laughs> people that care about it have already found me, so it's fine. Um, yeah, might have to move again. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not moving again. Stay in there. I I just want people that are going to culinary school not to get spooked if they have like a different vision or a different experience, because I know that can actually be what makes you a success in the industry, but you might feel uncomfortable while you're in school with people doing something more standard. And I think this, uh, this pandemic has really changed that and brought it to the forefront because the typical restaurant business isn't, it's not happening right now. So now you have to be inventive. You have to be entrepreneurial and try different things. There's a lot of people that want to pick up, you know, just home cooks that want to pick up, you know, like I have, arrange some people want to learn how to eat healthier some people just they don't have the basic cooking skills to make anything taste better if they did it so you know i kind of tailor my at-home teaching to whatever their needs are and then i'm working in their kitchen with their equipment so i know what you know what the issues are yeah because i'm in there looking at it you know and i can kind of give them some suggestions and 90 percent of my cooking classes end up being knife skills 101 <laughs> like that immediately elevates whatever we're doing 120 percent because i'm like you can't throw a half onion in there with a couple of these little nubs and like what are you <laughs> what do you do and like um so yeah that just basic skills like that are what most people are missing that is really just, I mean, you know, people want to learn about specific recipes and cuisines. I'm like, you're, you're not at that level. Like you yeah. really need to get a basic grasp of chemistry and how things work and start low and move up. So yeah, perfect. Well, that's just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Amber, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We really appreciate your time, your insight and your honesty. Thank you. I appreciate being on. Okay. Thanks again. Really enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye now. All right. Take care. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next Culinary School Story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.